Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Norlock, the interim director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. And this year, the center has had its programming centered on the theme of fame, celebrity, and the concept of genius. And we've been exploring this through presentations, through events, through film. This semester, there is a seminar, a faculty seminar, that is exploring the theme. And it meets every Friday afternoon. Uh, Professor Sharon Marcus spoke to us on Monday about Sarah Bernhardt and the duality of celebrity. And, uh, Sharon was in our seminar last Friday, and will be back with us again tomorrow, along with our speaker this evening. And coming up over the next several weeks, we have uh, Andre Markovitz, who will be speaking to us about sports and the celebrity of sports and how that impacts our culture, both in the US and Europe, and looking at some of the, of the distinctions and the differences of a European sports-based culture and ours, and how the celebrities there vary from continent to continent. April 1st, at the Cleveland Museum of Art, we have poetry in the museum with poet Jody, Jordy, Jory Graham, thank you. It's been a long afternoon, gang. And Jory Graham, and uh, these, these readings will be taking place in, in, in the gallery. And there, were, there was a competition earlier this year for poems that were based on a work of art that is exhibited in the museum. And, we will be reading those, and the, the winners of the competition will be there and reading their works at the actual works of art. So this is Sunday afternoon, April 1st. A few small bits of business before we continue. Here we have the lavender sheet. Some of you have seen this as the yellow sheet, and some as the blue sheet, and some of the uh, orange sheet, but this is the feedback sheet that tells us who you are while you're here and what you would like to see in the future as we move into the programming for next year. Next year's theme, by the way, is revolution. And uh, we are just now beginning the process of assembling the programming, contacting our speakers, and uh, we will have that all together probably about by the end of uh, June. And uh, if you hand in one of these, you're on our mailing list. And you're among the first in your neighborhood to receive the news of the Baker Nord Center. Along with that is Friends of the Baker Nord, which uh, we will have envelopes here. And so you can, uh, on the way home from, uh, from school yesterday, I turned on NPR, and they are in, in the middle of their annual front, uh, fund drive, or one of their fund drives. And we don't bother you on the radio. We, we just stand up here for 30 seconds and say, if you would like to be a member of Baker Nord, and the benefits are listed here, the forms are up front. And now to this afternoon. Professor Leo Brody is a university professor at the University of Southern California, where he holds the Leo S. Bing Chair in English and American Literature, and is a professor of English and history. Professor Brody, among America's leading film critics and a frequent, <coughs> and a, <coughs> and a frequent finalist for National Book Awards, teaches restoration literature and history, American culture after World War II, popular culture and critical theory, including the histories of visual style and film genre. 
His work appears in journals such as American Film, Film Quarterly, Genre, Novel, The Partisan Review, and Prose Studies, to name a few. His book, Jean Benoit, The World of His Films, was a finalist for the National Book Award. The Frenzy of Renown, Fame and Its History, was a finalist for the National Book, of, the National Book Critics Circle Award and has been one of the anchor te texts for our faculty seminar this semester. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Harper's. His most recent book, From Chivalry to Terrorism, was named Best of the Best by the Los Angeles Times and a notable book of the year by the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming to Case Western Reserve University and the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities, Professor Leo Brody. Good evening and thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. I should say, actually the most recent book is this one uh, about the Hollywood sign, which uh, came out uh, just about a year ago from uh, Yale University Press, and I'll be drawing on that today for my presentation. Uh, it just came out in paperback as well, which is, makes it much nicer. So the Hollywood sign here. Where does the Hollywood sign come from? Where does Hollywood come from, really? Hollywood is a real geographic place. It's a business, it's a vision, it's an ideal site of dreams of fame and fortune. But how did that name come to be? How did it come to be a kind of umbrella term for all that was happening in and around the movies there, whether it's happening in Hollywood or not? And if you look at the history of Hollywood, there are very few studios in Hollywood, there are very few famous people live in Hollywood, and very few movies were made in Hollywood. So where does Hollywood come from? And it's one of the conundrums that I posed to myself when I started working on this. Actually, in the early film business, uh, Triangle, one of the main uh, production companies pre-1920, was in Culver City, oh, at least 15 miles from Hollywood. Uh, Max Sennett was working in Edendale, another eight miles away. Uh, Santa Monica was the place where Thomas Ince made his western. So why did Hollywood somehow become uh, the word uh, that that meant this. It took a while for it to develop. In 1914, there's a Los Angeles Times story called Where Movies Are Hatched. Does it talk about Hollywood? No, it talks about the San Fernando Valley, where Universal Studios was uh, housed and still is there, of course, in Universal City. So what was Hollywood? Here's the original tract map of Hollywood. It was 120 acres. It was founded by Harvey and his wife, Dayida Wilcox. She was from Hicksville, Ohio, just kind of <laughs> appropriately metaphoric, uh, coming, to <laughs> coming to Hollywood here. They arrived in the 1880s. It was the time of the railroad real estate boom. The railroad would come in uh, and build things along the way. They would establish a station. And then instead of a church or a bank or even a restaurant or something like that, they would establish a hotel for people to come in uh, and buy land there. This was part of it, and the name Hollywood, they called it Hollywood. There are about eight or 10 different stories about why they called it Hollywood. One of the most, uh, most repeated is that Dayida was on a train somewhere and met a woman who was talking about her home, which she called Hollywood, and she said, that's a nice name, I'll call it Hollywood. But many people have claimed it. I actually, uh, my favorite story is that um, in the late 19th century, a lot of the rich in Chicago liked to go to Long Branch, New Jersey, and in Long Branch, New Jersey, there was a Hollywood hotel. So who knows how the name drifted in, but that became the name that they used. So it's not the movie business yet, but certainly the sense of self-promotion that is really part of the DNA of Hollywood started really at this time too. Uh, the Hollywood is founded in 1887. In 1888, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce is founded. And Los Angeles very quickly becomes one of the most promoted cities in the world. But promoted, again, not for the movie business, because a little early for the movies, which will take another decade before they really start going, but for people to come and retire. I mean, this is the kind of movement in California. Why do people come to California? First, they come for the gold rush in the mid-19th century. Then they come for the health rush. They come to, to become better. Or as uh, the cynics say, they come there to die, really. They come into a nice climate there. So from gold 
to health, and then finally, let's say, to fame, to those visions of being all visions in one way or another, tangible or intangible visions of becoming a better person there. What was Hollywood like in those days? Well, here's a brochure, brochure, early brochure for Hollywood. Uh, what it looked like there, the city of Hollywood, sort of cut off at the bottom there, but what it says is noted for its many beautiful homes, fine paved streets, and pleasant drives. It's beautiful neighborhoods here. Uh, and in 1903, Hollywood is, is uh, established, is incorporated as what was called in the California Civic Code, a municipality of the sixth class. That meant it had between 500 and 3,000 population. So it's a pretty small place. And it's really, it's built, it's built for the rich to a great extent. Uh, in fact, Hollywood sees its competitor as being Pasadena. The Rose Bowl Parade, the Tournament of Roses, all these things had started. And Har Hollywood starts its own parades with flowers and cars and things like that to start. But also, at the same time, Hollywood wanted to be an enclave. It was an enclave for the rich as well as a place where they should go. Uh, there are some of the early ordinances after Hollywood is established. One of them, they try to outlaw any noisy or smelly industry. You know, no livery stables, no blacksmiths, nothing that made noise, nothing that stunk. No liquor, of course, as well. It was a temperance community. Both the Wilcoxes were prohibitionists. I mean, you know, the history of Hollywood is just filled with, with ironies uh, of this sort. Uh, there, were signs, there were signs on um, rooming houses, the few rooming houses that existed in Hollywood, that said, no Jews, dogs, or actors allowed. So I mean, again, it was a place that you, know, you were supposed to retreat to. It was a retreat from the world at a time, of course, when things were happening you know, right around here, uh, happening in Illinois, happening in Ohio, kinds of you know, agitators, foreigners, people like that, uh, who were somehow coming in and destroying what, you know, some idea of what America ought to be like. And so this was a place to retreat to. Here's an example of one of the houses of Hollywood at that time. Uh, this is the house of, of a painter named Paul de Longpre. Paul, uh, this is about um, 1906, I would say. It's built in about 1902. He was a painter. He painted uh, flowers. He started as a ceramic painter, um, much the same way that Renoir did. Uh, and um, he was very successful. Then he lost all his money in the Crédit Mobilier uh, scandals of the late uh, 1890s. He moved to New York, became very popular in New York but then was lured out, came out to Los Angeles because for his health, he had some kind of brain tumor, some kind of abscess. It's hard to tell from the newspaper reports, but he comes out there and he is lured here by Deida Wilcox because again, this was, this was a high-toned Hollywood. She, would, she gave free land to artists and she gave free land, respectable artists, of course, and she gave free land to churches as well to kind of create this image of the Hollywood that she wanted to see there. This, this is another view of the De Longpre house at famous gardens there. And people would come on buses from downtown Los Angeles uh, and hopefully buy his paintings there as well. Here's another mansion uh, of Hollywood in that period. This is by uh, Dr. Schlosser. He built two great mansions here. This is called the, the uh, Castle Glengarry, one of the ones that he built. And then across the street, he sold that. He built another one called the Sans Souci. Uh, and there in the Sans Souci, the exteriors and some of the interiors were where Tilly's punctured romance uh, was filmed, the first full-length comedy in 1914, just around the same time as Birth of a Nation, actually preceding Birth of a Nation uh, by a little bit, but made by, by Max Sennett uh, and starring Marie Dressler as Tilly and Charlie Chaplin and Mabel Norman as two, uh, two con people trying to get, get her money here. So this is, here's, this is the mansion, and if you watch Tilly's Punctured Romance today, you'll see the, what it looks like. And this is what that same street corner looks like today. So there's a kind of fall, I think, a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of lapse uh, in the history of Hollywood. And this is one of the problems of the history of Los Angeles in general and, and Hollywood in particular, to lose your past. This is, theme that I'll come back to, that is when, when does Los Angeles, when does Hollywood decide that it has a past, a past to be celebrated and a past to be interested in? Uh, 
This is perhaps the only major studio built within the confines of, uh, of that tract of land in Hollywood. And this is a studio that's built in 1918 by Charlie Chaplin. Uh, it's built on La Brea. And it's built actually in the, near the corner of La Brea and De Longpre, the street named after that uh, painter, Paul De Longpre, uh, when uh, Hollywood uh, became part of Los Angeles, consolidated in 1910. Consolidation was a good thing. It was not a next. It was too important to be a next, so it was consolidated. And they wanted the main street of Hollywood, which was called uh, Prospect Avenue. Uh, and there was a movement to name it after De Longpre as the most famous um, resident of Hollywood. But finally, it was called Hollywood Boulevard uh, instead. And he sort of gracefully bowed out of it. And they named this other little street, uh, East West Street, after him instead. So this is, uh, as I said, this is Chaplin's studio. Uh, the, it looks this way. Why does it look this way? It looks like a little English village somehow. Uh, because there was a great resistance from the city fathers, from the city council of Hollywood, to build anything resembling a movie studio in Hollywood. So we had to make this kind of facade to make it look like it wasn't a studio at all. They were also worried, it's very near Hollywood High, which it already was operating, and they were worried that students would cut classes and come over and watch movies being filmed. But finally, somebody spoke up on the city council and said, this man has made more money for Hollywood than anybody else in the world, so let him build a studio. Now, this studio is, in fact, still there today. It, for a while, it was uh, A&M uh, Records, um, and, and other kinds. Red Skelton owned it at one point. Uh, but now it um, it's houses Jim Henson puppets, and there's Kermit the Frog, uh, of course, uh, dressed like Charlie Chaplin at the top. And actually, you can see a little painting of Chaplin here uh, on the side of the door there. It's pretty much the same uh, as it was then, of course, with the various kind of high-tech improvements there were. Now, there are other, you know, other kinds of things are going on uh, in Hollywood at the same time. And I'm still talking about, I haven't come up to the sign yet. The sign will appear in 1923. And this is really the prehistory of what's going on in Hollywood. But here's an interesting place here. This is a, just about a half a block, was, doesn't exist anymore, about a half a block off Hollywood Boulevard, uh, where lived a well-known figure not always associated with Hollywood. Uh, and that's L. Frank Baum. Uh, this is called Oscott. Um, and this, he built this house, and he had also had famous gardens, just not as big as DeLong Praise, but uh, similar. Uh, and he wrote all the Oz books here in Hollywood except for the first one. Uh, and intriguingly, uh, both Baum and his wife were theosophists. Uh, they, came, they came from Chicago, uh, and uh, his mother-in-law was a, was a big wheel in the theosophist uh, movement there. Uh, and nearby, nearby, and there's no evidence that I could find about their relationship, other than the fact that they were theosophists, about their relationship. But only about four or five blocks away was a theosophist community, also on the, um, the hills of Beechwood Canyon, where the Hollywood sign would rise in a few years. And this is an early picture of that. All these buildings are still there. Uh, it's just a little harder to see them now, because so much has been built up. And this is actually the, um, the Temple of the Rosy Cross, uh, which is now an apartment house. But it still looks like this and still has the same kind of entrance way. So, you know, the part of the point, part of the point here is the sense of this whole area as a place to build your own utopia in. Whatever that kind of utopia was. It could be a religious utopia. It could be a, a utopia of fame and fortune, uh, as would happen with the movie business there. A few blocks away from this, by the way, this, this is built in 1912, this whole community with various houses sprinkled around, this being the center. But not too far away, in the 1930s, is this Vedanta temple there uh, that was frequented by Christopher Isherwood and Aldous Huxley uh, and other, other converts there. Uh, and you can see it's here, and then there's a kind of green and green house right next to it, the kind of parish house. And actually, if, come, you know, if you saw what's over here, it's the freeway. It's the elevated freeway. So this, this, in a way, was saved by development there, because nobody really knows, unless you know where you're going, unless you know it's there to begin with, you can't really find it there. But another, as I said, another kind of, another kind of utopianism. So I've been talking about the original naming of Hollywood. But then how did Hollywood, that word, come to mean the film business? when so few movie people lived here, so few films were made there, and so few studios existed there. Uh, 
in part, this really happens, in great part, it's really a product of the 1920s, that Hollywood is a name, an umbrella name, that pulls together a lot of contradictory images and a lot of geographic places, all in the Los Angeles area, but not really in Hollywood there. So there are two, there are two images of Hollywood. The first, this is the second. The first is a kind of booster narrative fueled by real estate development and the Los Angeles Times that is happening in the early 1920s. Uh, in 1921, the Los Angeles Times runs a story. The, the headline says, Slogan Tells Gospel Truth. The US Chamber of Commerce recently sent out a map showing the entire country black except a wide circle around the LA uh, and declaring that only in the white spot was the business good. Now, if you detect some kind of racial uh, implication here of the, blacks, the black country and the white spot here, I think you're probably correct here. But what they're at least explicitly talking about is that this is the good, the good place to do business. People should come to Los Angeles to do this. And there's a whole campaign that the Los Angeles Times puts on called Greater Southern California Straight Ahead there, uh, promoting the city, promoting development, in the city, promoting it so much that actually the city fathers of Tombstone, Arizona, make a trip to Los Angeles to learn ways to promote their own city. I mean, the gunfight at the OK Corral happened in the 1880s, but nobody paid any attention to it until the 1920s when they took a few cues from what Los Angeles was doing and started creating the tombstone, the, you know, the tourist tombstone that exists today. So this Los Angeles, and then in, in 1923, just around the time that the Hollywood sign was about to be put up, uh, another headline appears that says, Los Angeles officially declared America's finest place to live. Uh, and the, I like, what I like best about that story is the way they kind of downplay Northern California in it. Uh, they say, the northernmost hot, dry, electrically charged wind causes ner nervous disturbances, and that's why nobody wants to live in San Francisco. <laughs> So this is the second part. This is the second part of the narrative, the negative side of the narrative there. First side is the booster side. The negative side is the scandal side. And they're all happening in the 1920s there. You have the Fatty Arbuckle scandal, which happened in San Francisco, but still it gets labeled at LA. You have the murder of William Desmond Taylor, who was three times uh, the head of the Screen Directors Guild there. You have the death of Wallace Reed after drug addiction. You have the death of various people. Olive Thomas, considered to be the first flapper, who was the wife of Jack Pickford, Mary Pickford's brother. So Hollywood starts becoming, at the same time that the promotion is going on, Hollywood starts being denounced in pulpits across the country, and especially by the women's clubs, you know, which was a very strong association. Hollywood then becomes, the word Hollywood becomes, a kind of handy synecdoche for everything that's happening in Hollywood. And in this sense of Hollywood as a devouring place, we have this. This is, this is a film from 1923 called Hollywood. Uh, and in fact, it's a comedy. But look at how the lure is. Here's this, you know, this great head swallowing up these you know, young women who have come to Hollywood. Uh, what one uh, early Hollywood director called the posses of penniless pulchritude that roam the streets uh, of Hollywood there. So the place that the Wilcoxes had founded as an escape from the evils of the city was now turning into an image of crime itself there. And one of the only books, and you know, another uh, writer associated with that area who was you know, often not thought of uh, as connected to Los Angeles is Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Edgar Rice Burroughs of course, the Tarzan stories uh, and the John Carter stories and this new movie coming out. He wrote one book set in a contemporary, with a contemporary setting, The Girl from Hollywood, also from 1923. Uh, and look at the little opium pipe down here at the bottom there. Uh, so as far as he was concerned, the only thing that could cure Hollywood was to go off and live on a ranch and live in nature and things like that because it was such a, a degenerate place. And he did, you know, he had a ranch in the San Fernando Valley where the city of Tarzana uh, is now there. Well, let's move to the Hollywood sign. And of course, it's not the Hollywood sign at this point, it's the Hollywood land sign. 
The same year, the effort to create another kind of modern utopia and escape from the city is, is in Hollywood land, which is in the area of Beechwood Canyon. The sign is on Mount Lee. Beechwood Canyon is down here. And here's a kind of publicity photo for the breaking of the land. And once again, the Los Angeles Times is very instrumental in putting this together. Uh, Harry Chandler, who is the publisher of the Times, is one of the big investors in, in, the Hollywood, um, in Hollywood land. And what he said to, um, to the person who was constructing the sign, he said, I want those letters to be visible from Wilshire. Now, Wilshire, if you know Hollywood, uh, it, you know, it's far away, if you know that area. Uh, but also, at that time, Wilshire was a dirt road through the oil derricks there. So it was only partially paved. The Miracle Mile and all those things only happened a little bit later there. Um, but it is becoming, starting to become important. And of course, he wants it to be seen. But what does he mean he wants it to be seen from Wilshire? He wants it to be seen from a car. He wants it to be seen from a car, because the car is becoming important here uh, as well. Uh, to, you know, to a great extent, up to, up to the early 1920s, cars were a lot more expensive. Uh, and of course, you know, with Ford bringing out the Model T and the Model A, uh, they became more affordable for middle class people who could also come out and buy land in Los Angeles. So uh, in fact, you know, I've read a lot of letters of pe people wrote home and, uh, in this period. And one of the main you know, entertainments was just to drive around in your car and look at developments. Because another thing is most of the cars were open. Sedans don't start coming in really until the late 20s uh, and into the early 30s there. So a little, just a little publicity for this uh, as well. Here's another publicity shot for the, you can see the sign down here at the bottom. Uh, these starlets in a steam shovel here, probably lent by Max Sennett, who was also an investor uh, in Hollywood land. In fact, um, he wanted to, he cleared land up here. He wanted to build his house there uh, as well. And you know, they're all, it's very elaborately designed. It was never built because, because he ran out of money. So here are the starlets here. And this is what it looked like in 1924. This, this is the office, the real estate office, which is still there uh, of the uh, sign, uh, of Hollywood Land Realty Company, rather. And there, of course, the sign in the background. Here's an early ad then. This is 1924 as well, an early ad. So, you know, what is the lure? What is the lure? Hollywood land above the turmoil of the city. Close to the center, you can get nearby, but in fact, you're moving away. And look at the way the city is characterized. The city is this place, uh, actually, it's the place in other ads, and here it's called of smoke and fog. No one has coined the word smog yet, uh, but they talk about smoke and fog. So we're right on the cusp of that coinage. Here. And here's this young couple in their nice little roadster uh, who are going up here. Uh, you know, and if you look through the, you know, the language of the ad, do it for your family's sake. Get into the good air. Get away from the city. And of course, the city with all the problems uh, of urbanism and, you know, and these other groups that were coming into Hollywood, uh, at, excuse me, coming into Los Angeles uh, as well. The sign was also illuminated. Sign was also illuminated, it had 40,000 20 watt bulbs in it, and there was a guy who lived nearby whose main job was changing the bulbs, uh, uh, of course. Uh, the, the, um, the sign was built on telephone poles. They were dragged up by mules, the letters were 45 feet high, although you'll frequently see people saying we're 50 feet high, but I, I get to, uh, that's a, another Hollywood exaggeration uh, that in fact isn't true. Um, and it would blink. It would go Hollywood land, Hollywood land. So I mean, it was definitely a great lure. And it's early. It's very early for this, too. I mean, neon is just starting to come in. And actually, another uh, nearby development uh, wants to imitate the Hollywood sign. And they use neon, which had only recently been brought over from France uh, as, a, as a new way of a mode of advertising. It was first used by a car dealer. Uh, I think the first time in America was used by this car dealer in downtown Los Angeles. Here's the brochure. Here's the brochure, 1925-26 uh, or so. Hollywood Land, five minutes from Hollywood's Great White Way, a pictorial record of actual photographs taken in this distinctive home place. Now this looks like this looks like it might be a movie premiere, but in fact, if you look through this brochure, there is not one word about the movie business in it. 
Uh, there's there's a, one of the people featured as a columnist for the Hearst Papers. That's about it. Uh, it's really still, it's about privilege, it's about separateness, and it's not about the movie business at all. What it is, it's the great white way. It's an imitation of New York, and it's about business. It's about the commercial side uh, of Hollywood. Uh, that's really important here and really what they're, what they're talking about. To the extent the movies were in this, it's really about the lavish theaters like the Egyptian and the Chinese that were being built on Hollywood Boulevard. It's about the exhibition of movies. That's fine, but not about the production uh, and not about the, make, not about the making and distribution uh, of movies. In fact, shortly after Ka uh, Chaplin's studio was put up, one of the main developers in town uh, develop, who developed the Chinese theater and the, uh, and the Egyptian theater and the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and a lot of the big buildings along Hollywood Boulevard pushed through the city council an ordinance that said any new studio had to be way below Santa Monica there. Uh, you know, which doesn't mean, I mean, actually, it's just a couple blocks today, but, you know, really preserving this uh, as the kind of upper uh, class enclave uh, that, that he felt it was meant to be. Here is the uh, perhaps the most famous story about the sign, a woman who figures in that. Uh, her name is Peg Entwistle, uh, and according to the story, uh, she committed suicide by climbing up the H and jumping off the H, uh, and in the usual version, uh, it's because she was disappointed as a starlet, and I, try to, I don't know really what happened, but I tried to cast some doubt on the story uh, in, in the book here, because in fact, if you look at the record, her option was being picked up. She had been in a movie uh, shortly before that. She was a, she'd come from New York. She'd come from the theater girl. She was in a lot of plays. Uh, why, you know, it, but it be, it, again, it fit the myth. Disappointed starlet commits suicide. In fact, she had a note in her pocketbook which said, I'm afraid I'm a coward. I am sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. P.E., Peg Entwistle. Not a word about that. Something that happened a long time ago, if she had failed in the movies, which is dubious, that was about two months before that when the film was released, her, her one film was released. So again, uh, it, it's somewhat dubious that those are her motivations as far as I'm concerned, uh, but in fact, as I said, you know, it fits the myth. The myth somehow swallows it up. It's also a very long walk up to the sign. This is a shot from her uncle's house where she lived, which is still there. Uh, and you know, you to get to it, you'd have to walk all the way up here. There are no sidewalks. This, was a, this is a development built for cars, not for pedestrians. Uh, this hillside is incredibly slippery. Uh, when I was up there with the head of the Hollywood Sign Trust, I came down, there's a road right back here. And I came down from the road, that was okay. When I tried to get back up, it took me about a half an hour you know, to, you know, to go a couple hundred feet because it's like walking in sand up there. So again, it's, it's a difficult kind of thing to do. She had to be really resolute. So what are the fortunes of the sign? How does the sign evolve? This is the sign in 1936 in a movie called Hollywood Boulevard. The sign was meant to be temporary. It was an advertising sign. It was for a commercial reason. It's like, it was like the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower was meant to be temporary also. But somehow, over the years, it started to get a little aura to it. No one paid a lot of attention to the sign. It appears actually in very few films before the 1970s. It's not considered to be a symbol of Hollywood. If Hollywood is supposed to be signified in a movie, like in one of those montages that you always see, uh, at the beginning of films in the 1930s. It's really the Brown Derby restaurant uh, or the Chinese theater. That what really means Hollywood, not the Hollywood land sign. And in this picture, well, it's a little fuzzy here because I took it off, you know, I took it off the film there, but you can already see the deterioration in the sign. Maintenance on the sign decisively ended in 1939. By 1949, the H had fallen down for years. So it just said Hollywood for several years. And actually, somebody did that on purpose later with the Iran-Contra hearings. They masked the H for Oliver North, so it said Hollywood again there. But this time it was because the H was blown down, uh, blown down in a storm. So what happens? In 1949, the, the city of Los Angeles Parks and Recreation Department says, this is a public menace. We're going to tear it down. Hollywood Chamber of Commerce steps up uh, and says, 
we'll take care of it. We'll take care of it. But let's take the land off. So this is a decisive moment in the history of the making of the Hollywood sign as an icon. It loses its connection to the real estate development that gave it birth, and it just uh, now says Hollywood there. This is a shot from a film called Down Three Dark Streets from 1953, a kind of minor but interesting film noir with uh, Broderick Crawford. Uh, and they're using the sign, but you know, it seems to me that I can, you can make a kind of interesting connection between the deterioration of Los Angeles that you see in film noir, the dark side of Los Angeles, uh, and what's happening to the sign. They keep repairing it, they keep patching it. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to do uh, because it was a mess to begin with. It was temporary to begin with. There's just a lot of, a lot of sheet metal on these telephone poles there. Uh, so w this crucial moment is more emblematic than it is actual. It's not really physical when it becomes a, an icon in 1949 there. Many patchings are done from the late 60s into the early 70s. But people are just beginning, some people, to see the sign as something more than an ordinary sign. <laughs> January 1st, 1976, uh, people wake up and they see this. Now, you know, I, I was casting doubt on the Peg Entwistle story and some of the details of it, but at least this, what does the story do? The story says that she saw the sign symbolically. She saw it as meaning Hollywood. So I think, you know, it's a crucial moment, questionable in terms of its reality, but a crucial moment in the history of the sign. This is another crucial moment. A young man named Danny Finegood, who's taking a course in public art at the university, uh, at the Cal State University in Northridge, is supposed to do a project, a public art project. So what does he do? He takes two pieces of white material and two pieces of black material, and he changes the sign. Also, the California State Legislature had just recently decriminalized mar marijuana. So you know, it was a celebration of that, too. So what's significant about this? He sees the sign as a piece of sculpture. He sees the sign as malleable. He sees the sign as, as plastic in some way. And I think, you know, that's, it's, a, it's really a, a crucial moment there. Uh, things are starting to change. So this is 76. Uh, the, the Los Angeles Conservancy, the first real um, effort to try to preserve Los Angeles history and Hollywood history, all, the history of the whole area, is founded in 1978. These are phenomena of, the of the late 1970s. The push forward perhaps came a bit in the 50s and 60s with the effort to save Watts Towers, which also the Los Angeles uh, Department of, of uh, Parks and Recreation wanted to tear down because they said it was unstable. I'm sure many of you know the story. They said it was unstable. They put a 10,000 pound weight at the top of the biggest tower and they tried to pull it down and it didn't work. It was actually a lot more stable than a lot of the buildings in town. So the, you know, that kind of effort to save Watts Towers, I think, is really part of the background here. But still, nevertheless, the sign deteriorates. Uh, and here's a movie. This is 1976. Here's a movie from 1976 called Hollywood Boulevard, a kind of uh, exploitation movie, a kind of Roger Corman uh, produced movie here. And you can see it's covered with graffiti here. And here's the, here's the killer. Uh, the evil person there in, in front of the sign. You know, the, the color is washed out. Uh, actually, the evil person is about to kill the good people, and the Y falls over and squashes her. So that, that, that's, that's the happy ending. But you can see, as I said, the graffiti uh, and the uh, deterioration of the sign. So who comes to the rescue? Who, un, you know, some people uh, who are hard to think of as the rescuers of the sign, and here's one of them. Hugh Hefner. By the late 1970s, as I was saying, the sense that some parts of LA, of the LA past and the Hollywood past needed to pre, uh, be preserved aggressively reached the sign. And this is about the third or fourth or fifth or sixth effort because you, know, you can look back through the files and there are all sorts of the committee to save the sign, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they keep trying and it never really works. This time it works and it's spearheaded by the unlikely pair of Hugh Hefner uh, and Alice Cooper. Both of them, intriguingly, newcomers to town. Hugh Hefner had just moved the Playboy Mansion from Chicago to Los Angeles about two years before, uh, and Alice Cooper had also just arrived in Hollywood and actually became best friends with Groucho Marx. I mean, again, these kind of weird juxtapositions. Groucho, <laughs> Groucho had died, 
And so Alice Cooper felt, as a tribute to Groucho, he would get involved in raising money to change the sign. To, to redo each letter, you had to contribute $27,777.77 to do this. And it's, it, well, the intriguing part of it is how few movie people were involved. It was, there were many more businessmen involved. There were, of course, Hefner and Alice Cooper were involved. The closest person to the movie business involved was Gene Autry, who bought one of the letters. Uh, but Gene Autry, by this time, you know, owned sports teams and radio stations and things like that. Uh, he had a past, certainly, as the singing cowboy, uh, but not. Andy Williams also bought a letter as well, but from the music business. As far as the movie business was concerned, constructing the sign, contributing to the sign, was just a non-starter. So here's a picture of what the sign looked like before it was reconstructed. And here are the stages of rebuilding of the sign. Helicopters brought in things. Again, it was 45 feet high. I talked to the, to the guy, Raiden Peterson, who supervised the construction. They traced the letters. They traced everything exactly. But they made it more permanent. It cost $250,000, which actually was about the equivalent of what it cost in 1923, intriguingly enough. Uh, it weighs 240 tons. Uh, it has 20 steel footings sunk 13 feet into that slippery hillside uh, I was telling you about. And the letters are made of corrugated steel with baked white enamel uh, on them. So it's, it's there in a much more permanent way. And here's Peterson's picture then of the rebuilt sign. And actually, if you go up there, you can see the stubs of the old telephone poles uh, still in the ground from, from where the sign was there. So the rebuilding happened, but the rebuilding didn't prevent more modification, more kind of freelance modification. Here's a couple Caltech kids who have somehow figured out by computer how to, how to drape uh, uh, white paper across it to make it say Caltech rather than, than Hollywood there. Uh, here's my favorite view of the sign. Uh, this is actually from the Griffith Observatory, where you, might, you all, I'm sure, remember from Rebel Without a Cause, with the end of Rebel Without a Cause. And here's a bust of James Dean with the Hollywood sign uh, in the background. Uh, the, um, and actually, it says the lettering on the, on the back of this uh, plinth says, uh, James Dean was not a rebel. He was a great actor who played a rebel. You know, see, people were worried about these kinds of distinctions, but at least they, they put this up. Here's a, here's a view of the sign not usually seen uh, from, from the west and the dog, uh, dog park that's actually underneath the sign here. And you can see the flattened part up here that, um, that Max Sennett, uh, great, Max Sennett's mother, actually, she was the supervisor. He get, left it all to his mother. She, she um, leveled it there. Uh, she had, um, according to his autobiography, uh, he says that um, they were having a lot of trouble when, when they were leveling it because there were so many snakes there. So they brought in 50 uh, feral pigs to eat the snakes. Uh, but no one has ever mentioned any packs of feral pigs in Griffith Park. So I don't know if this is a, a myth or not, but it's a, it's a colorful one. And here, a real close-up of the sign. This really, these are all these microwave towers and things like that. There, there was a TV station was built up here in the 30s behind it, and it was built uh, by a fellow named Lee, which is why this is called Mount Lee now. Mount Hollywood is actually uh, behind the, the Griffith Observatory there. So this is, I think, part of the, the meaning of the sign right here. This is just a young family uh, at, on the, at the Griffith Observatory uh, taking a picture. To put yourself in the picture with the sign, uh, you know, and I'm sure some of you read the recent story about the, how, the, how the neighbors around the sign are upset because the sign is now on GPS there, too. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, and trying to get close to the sign is, a, is chimerical, it seems to me. The whole point of the sign is that it's far away. I mean, it's like the whole ideal, I think, uh, of aspiration there. It's a liminal space there. It celebrates human growth. And it's in, you know, it's in the midst uh, of a kind of ruined nature there. And actually, you know, the, the ideal, the sense of illusion, you want to get too close to it, you're trying to put, you know, give some substance to your ideals there. But it's really, it's in the ruggedness. It's, it's the fact that the sign uh, is far away. Part of the difficulty, part of the lure of the sign, like the lure of Hollywood, uh, in American life, in the American consciousness, is the difficulty of getting there. It's like fame and fortune itself, which recedes before us even as we try to get closer and closer to it. 
Well, but now, by now, of course, with all these changes over the years, and you know, as I said, it's like, well, it's really only been 30 years, basically, that it's penetrated uh, not only American consciousness, but also the world consciousness as the symbol uh, of Hollywood there, forever de uh, defined as the icon of, of show business in general there. And here's just to wind up a recent uh, editorial cartoon after the death of Whitney Houston. So in a sense, you know, here with the, with the pills here uh, and the Hollywood sign, uh, in a sense, uh, Hollywood is still, uh, has that double nature uh, that, that it had in the 1920s and the paradoxical relationship that I was des uh, describing in the 1920s. It's simultaneously the land of dreams and the den of iniquity. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? Everybody want to weigh in? Yeah. In the early buildings that you showed us, that looked like Indian architecture. Yeah, well, there were a lot. It was part of, yeah. Well, the, uh, the let me get this feedback. The Castle Glengarry, you know, was kind of modeled on a Scottish castle, uh, and Sans Souci was a Moor, it was a combination. Uh, the uh, the Long Prairie House was Moorish, in that way. I mean, it's very, it's you know, if you've been to Los Angeles, it's it's part of that architectural eclecticism, that was really very much uh, part of the, the development of Los Angeles. Uh, the um, Hollywood Land had a strict, you, you only could build in certain styles there. Uh, mainly Spanish colonial, but also French provincial, things like that. You know, there was like five or six styles that were allowable uh, in there. And it's all, I mean, these were the kind of things like that Nathaniel West, let's say, in Day of the Locust, and a lot of the writers who came from the uh, East Coast, you know, were sneered at, you know, this, all the, the Elizabethan house next to a Spanish colonial house. But it's, it's also an evidence, you know, looking at it more positively, it's an evidence of that kind of sense of individual, of aesthetic individualism, and also wanting to connect to, to these different pasts there as well. You know, that brochure that I, uh, that I showed you the cover of, the brochure for Hollywood Land, the main point in that brochure, the main thing that they're arguing in addition to saying buy here, is how fast the vegetation grows up. So a lot of before and after pictures of people whose houses were built in 1923 and what they look like in 1925 because I guess people were worried about the bareness of the hillside then. But, you know, this was, I mean, that was, you know, the lushness, the lushness of Los Angeles and the, that, that area in particular. The area under the Hollywood Hills, you know, which is where that development is, uh, was called the frostless zone because you could get seven citrus crops a year out of it. It never froze. So, that, and now there was this, even streets called frostless there. And actually, if you, if you want to look a little further in this, Go on YouTube and look up a Chaplin movie that he made called How to Make Movies. It's on YouTube, and it's a description of how he built his studio. But in the opening shots, you see the citrus groves spreading out there, you know, before he starts there. Uh, of course, now all in, you know, there's citrus trees in people's backyards and things like that, but certainly all the old citrus groves of the past are long gone. endowment for maintenance, uh, who is responsible? Oh yes, thanks for asking. Yeah, it's, um, yes, there's an endowment, there's the Hollywood, the Hollywood Sign Trust is sort of sp spun off from the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, and they really take care of it. Uh, the, um, there are now, uh, although people are always sneaking in, uh, there's a fence, there's a chain link fence up there. There are motion detectors, there are video cameras, and all sorts of things that are, that are actually, so the security for the sign is run by the city. Uh, the land of the sign is the Hollywood Sign Trust, and they're responsible for that. Uh, and the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce gets, they own the trademark rights to the sign. Now, what is trademarked about the sign? You can't trademark the name Hollywood, and you can't trademark the sign if it exists in a geographic place. That is, um, uh, the, um, what is it, the, the, is it Fox or Universal? Yeah, it's Fox, 20th Century Fox. Uh, the Fox logo, you'll see this kind of, in the beginning of movies, it'll spin around, you'll see the sign in the background. Because it marks that geographic place, it cannot, uh, you know, cannot be copyrighted. What can be copyrighted is the arrangement of the letters. So the, the setbacks in the letters, where, you know, where the H is, where the O is, 
And a, and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, companies want to do that. They sued the Hollywood Video successfully because Hollywood Video on its own logo has, has that image of the, of the Hollywood sign. But any time that it's used in that way as a trademark, as a brand, uh, the Chamber of Commerce gets money that's used for maintenance. Yeah? By the fact that there's, well, first of all, um, the Ohioans, as people who have these fantasy invest uh, developments, because uh, Ohioans are also important in the development of Miami and um, that whole area about Miami Beach and mm -hmm. the railroad out to uh, in Hollywood, Florida. That's in Hollywood, Florida. I, I, I don't know about that specifically, but also the Flagler Railroad out through the Keys. But um, so there's this kind of people coming from gray, wet places <laughs> mm -hmm. um, investing in these kind of warm, uh, warm uh, fantasy lands. And the sort of analogy with Coral Gables, I didn't know whether you wanted to speak to this, but Coral Gables too is a fantasy land. It has a restrictions on what houses can look like and the kind of architecture and so forth. And of course, you know, as people may have made their money off of industry or manufacturing, but there's no manufacturing allowed there. Well, a lot of that development down there, of course, that was uh, done by the Meisner brothers. Uh, and the Meisner brothers, came, I mean, uh, Wilson came out of Los Angeles, basically. They were originally up in the gold rush, in the Alaska gold rush, uh, where he met Sid Grauman, you know, from, who would later become Grauman's, China, you know, found the Chinese theater. So, I mean, that kind of entrepreneurial side, the, 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 the relationship between entrepreneurship and fantasy, as you're saying, you know, and creating these new communities is very much there. Of course, Meisner was really milking a lot of the developments in Florida. Uh, but Addison, his, you know, the architect brother, you know, was really very instrumental in, in creating a lot of that style there, too. So there's definitely those kinds of relationships. Now, for the other part of what you're saying, you know, there's a, there's a whole connection between not only Ohio, but Chicago, in, you know, as a center, and the and Ohio area with the West Coast in that way, that's connected really to the, to the railroads. Uh, to the, you know, when the railroads open up in the 1880s and people start coming out and people start, you know, people go to California for their health, as I was saying there, and then they decide to stay there, you know, as, as many of these letters back go. So it's, you know, there's it definitely, it's about, it's about westward movement. You know, for a long time, um, uh, Los Angeles was described as the biggest city in the Midwest there. Yeah, yeah, because... Uh, you know, one of the features of, of early uh, Los Angeles life up through the 20s and 30s, uh, even, even later, uh, were these affinity clubs, uh, you know, based on where you came from. You know, the Ohio Club or the, you know, the Indiana Club, things like that. Yeah. Are there any other communities in the world that have sort of promoted themselves with a, a sign? Well, you know, not, I don't think, there are a lot of them that imitate this. Actually, there was a recent one where um, they wanted to put up in, in Wellington, New Zealand, they wanted to put up a sign that said Wellywood, <laughs> you, know, be, you know, because movies were being made there and things like that. And it was, it was knocked down by the, by the locals. I mean, it was uh, defeated by the locals. But you no, know, the Hollywood sign becomes that. The idea, I mean, it's an interesting question. I was trying to, I mean, one of the sort of blind alleys, you know, you, when you do these things, there are various blind alleys. Uh, it was not Blind Alley, it just never got to be a long street. Um, but I wanted to find out just about insignias on the land. I did find out some things. One thing was that the idea of putting a letter in, in, a, in a landscape uh, really started in Berkeley uh, in about 1906 uh, when they put a C for Cal uh, on the hillside. You know, and these became these kind of celebra- and it was picked up by universities and colleges around the country. So the idea, and actually, uh, if, you, if you see, a, there's some panoramic pictures of the uh, Hollywood sign in that area, there's an H that's way off on the side that was actually put up by Hollywood High, an even less permanent sign. So the, you know, that, you know, the names on the land, you might call it. I tried to find out something more about, because it was a Chinese habit, too, you know, to put pictographs carved into hillsides, but I could never get further. I kept asking a lot of Chinese art historians, and nobody, I mean, they knew that it existed, but nobody had really done uh, the kind of background. But it would be fascinating to find out just about that. You know, they're kind of putting, putting a, the impress of language, you know, onto this otherwise rugged nature. Did the movie industry consciously use 
usurp uh, this image, or did it just have, I mean, was it just so overwhelming that No, it I think it, it came, it could have caught them unawares. It caught them unawares. You know, the, the last, um, the last problem, uh, most recent problem, <laughs> the last problem, you know, I had finished this book a couple years ago, but I had to wait because there was a whole agitation. Uh, and this is what it was. In the early, uh, about 1940, uh, Howard Hughes uh, wanted to build a love nest up there for himself and Ginger Rogers. Uh, and just behind the sign, on that hill behind the sign. And, but then it, Ginger, you know, she, he was catting around too much and Ginger you know, dumped him and moved to Oregon, actually. Uh, and so it lay fallow for all these years. But he had gotten all the variances, all the utility variances and the road variances. It was just never built. So at a certain point in uh, like I know, about 2002 or three, something like that, the Hughes estate was trying to get rid of little parcels of property. And they sold that to a Chicago real estate company uh, for about one and a half, 1.7 million. Uh, and the Chicago company immediately then put it back on the market for 20 million and said that they were selling plots to build luxury housing up there. Of course, and everybody went crazy. Uh, my, I, I mean, I live in that district, and my local uh, councilman, you know, he said that the city dropped the ball. They had never bought this land. They never thought about it. Anyhow, they had a, so wouldn't it be awful to have luxury housing behind the sign? It would totally ruin its iconic nature. So it became a, a big negotiation, and the Trust for Public Land got in the middle of it, and they negotiated with this Chicago firm that if, um, if you would raise 12 million for the land, they would give up. So the land, you know, the, there was fundraising and all this was going on. And they had 11 million. You know, I, I was waiting. You know, I had to finish the book, basically. But I needed, of course, this was the end, you know, the most recent uh, problem with the sign. Uh, they had, and the time was, getting, time was getting short. And who comes riding to the rescue with the last million but Hugh Hefner? Again, <laughs> saving the sign twice. So you know the, the the land was bought and the sign, but up to that point, you know they're they're kind of uh, Photoshop things of what it would look like with houses behind the sign and and things like that. Yeah. So you know to answer your question, you know the, the main thrust of your question, uh, you know it Hollywood backs into it. Hollywood backs into it. By the time that comes up, you know two or three years ago, Steven Spielberg gives money, Tom Hanks gives money. You know, because they're later generations. But as far as the generation that made Hollywood is concerned, who cares about the sign? I mean, it meant nothing to them. So it's really, in some sense, created by fans. You know, created by people who wanted to have a word for what was going on uh, with the movies. You mentioned uh, the irregularity of the letters. I was under the impression, as you were talking, that that was simply a result of the terrain, but right. not an aesthetic decision. Was it uh, purposeful? No, I'm sure it was a result of the terrain, but now it's become permanent. And it's, you know, so it's part of the brand in that irregularity, and that's, and that's, exactly, that's exactly what they can copyright. Yes, sir, you had a question? We, uh, you say it's fenced off? Yes. No, I want to go there. How do I how do I get there? You can they, walk you can walk up behind it. There's a road that goes up behind it. Uh, you can't you know the last last time I was up there, you know, it's fenced off, but someone had dug a hole under the fence, so <laughs> you want to crawl under the fence. But otherwise, as I said, there you know motion sensors and cameras. Uh, you can get fairly close to it. Uh, there are a couple places below it, uh, but the um, because of that GPS thing, a lot of the you know, the locals have taken down the street signs and things like that and tried to block it off. There, which was true even when they were building the sign. You know, when they were building the sign originally, and when they were, not, not originally because there was nobody there, but when they were building the sign and rebuilding it in 1978, you know, there would be people with placards because of all the trucks going up there. You know, the hell with the sign, down with death to the sign. And things. The neighbor, neighbors also have this double nature. One is, I live right near the sign. I can see it out my window. I'm sure every, you know, people have relatives that say that, which is true. And the other is, but let's keep all the tourists out. <laughs> let's not let anybody come in here. Well, yeah. What is the sign, aside from being the topic of your research, what does the sign mean to you? Well, it means that, you know, I, I'm just fascinated by the process by which 
temporary things become permanent. And temporary things get invested with meaning. Uh, and invested with meaning you know, because of the audience, because you know, of some kind of cultural desire, some kind of general desire to, you know, to want to affix meaning. Uh, the, um, this is another funny story. In the late 1930s, uh, Culver City, which is where MGM was housed, and now Sony it took over uh, from MGM, uh, but also a, a couple other companies. Culver City petitioned to have its name changed to Hollywood because more movies were made there than were ever made in Hollywood. <laughs> well, you know, it was part of publicity stunt, but, you know, it was, it was true. Uh, and they finally, you know, worked it out, you know, smoothed things over. I think that they had a, a handshake or a burying of the hatchet in the forecourt of the Chinese theater or something. Said, okay, you can stay Culver City, you can stay Hollywood. But, you know, again, it's just, you know, the inarticulate way in which meaning kind of clusters around things. I mean, in, you know, as Zola and de Maupassant, um, they all signed a petition saying that Eiffel Tower is the ugliest thing I ever saw in my whole life. You know, get rid of it. You know, but the Eiffel Tower then, you know, became iconic gradually in the same way. It kind of mean, you know, it was just there for the World's Fair, but it stayed. We'll take one more question. Anybody else, please? Hey, yeah. I was wondering, uh, what's well, sort of fascinating that you actually can't get to the sign, that there hasn't been some sort of tourist trap set up to, you know, charge <laughs> you money and walk you by there. Um, but I was, so I was wondering how this sign, how, how you think the sign might relate just a few more comments, I guess, about branding and whether or not, because you can't, you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's not really accessible in some way, right. you know, it's sort of as you alluded. And then also, if you think that this, that this particular sign, when it arose in the 70s, if you think it relates to just the general neon sign culture in LA, which is mm -hmm. very much about, um, actually, I guess, more about accessibility. You can buy those things, you know, I mean, you drive through LA, and it's well, you know, L.A. is a funny place because L.A., for all its uh, ostentatiousness, also has a lot of secret places, too. And it's, um, you know, and it's an odd combination of that. It is very, it's so ostentatious. It is so there. It's so, you know, it's hard to miss no matter where you are in the city. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's inaccessible. You know, and so, you know, I was liking it so, so metaphorically to just the idea of aspiration or the movie business in general. And I think, you know, I think that's part of it. Too, you know, it's that goal, that goal that's constantly receding before you as you try to get near it. And also, in terms of that uh, that uh, picture of the, of the family, you want to put yourself into the picture. With it proves you were there. It proves you were there, and you you somehow uh, it's you know it's not unlike uh, you know say seeing a movie star in the supermarket or something like that. I mean, you know, it's the aura effect. It's the idea that in fact uh, there's a sense of what, world historical self-enhancement or something, to be grandiose about it, you know, by, that you are there with that sign, that you have somehow touched a, a larger reality. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we in Ohio understand that, in Cleveland particularly, all the cities that like to have the movies come and how we get so excited to be an extra or a house that's being, we know that house, mm -hmm. and you're, you're getting close to that that aura, and I think that uh, it, it isn't just Cleveland, Ohio, that went through that. Oh, no, no, that. I'm sure it's embedded in the head of every American, <laughs> and probably ver most people in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.